Thank you, Sister Annie. It's a blessing to see your children grow up in the Lord. It could be a great distraction if your whole house is not saved. Some people have had to deal with that very thing, and thankfully, uh, some of us have not. I'm grateful for that. Um, the sixth chapter is the longest chapter in the Gospel of John by about 12 verses. The next one would be the eighth chapter where Jesus talks about something very closely related to life, which is light, 58 verses long. That is very significant. It's as if the spirit halts when we come to the sixth chapter because there are things here that we have to get a hold of that are associated with life and godliness, and that has to do with the fact that Jesus is the bread of life. It is 71 verses long. It's very long. So I felt it appropriate for us to stick around here for a little bit and to look at more of what it means for Jesus to be the bread of life. I'm sure you understand if we were to exhaust my mind on this, which would be very, very quickly and very easily done when you compare it to all that is said here. That there is so much to be seen in this chapter of the sixth chapter of what it means for him to be the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger and he that believes on me shall never thirst. From the beginning, man was made in God's image and likeness. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. But although man is like God, he is not fully like God. For example, humanity is not a self-sustained creation. In fact, there is nothing that God has created that is self-sustained. All of it is dependent upon God, every bit of it. Humanity cannot give or sustain life. This is an exclusive prerogative of deity, is to give and to sustain life. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. And so humanity has this constant dependence upon God for the bringing forth of life and for its sustenance, both in the flesh and in the spirit. Apart from God, humanity only gets worse until he's finally destroyed because he is not a self-sustained being. So let's look at this for just a little bit because I think this will encourage us to depend more upon Christ. This idea of humanity being so dependent upon God, all created things have their origin with God. In the book of Job, we find this testimony. Ask now the beast and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this. Do we realize that in this regard, there are fishes that are smarter than human beings? The creation even knows where its origin is from. And if you ask it, it declares his glory. It shows forth these things, his divine power and Godhead, and yet men on earth do not receive this testimony that they have their origin in God, but it is still that way. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. By Isaiah we have this word, thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. When the apostle Paul spoke, on Mars Hill, he said, he giveth all life and breath and all things. That is the things that would sustain that life and breath. All of those things come forth from God. We must resist the notion to believe that life is somehow automatically sustained or sustained by some sort of impersonal force or law. That is Adam's view of these things. That's the way men think when they're not redeemed. They assume it just kind of goes on automatically, but it doesn't. 
it does not. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life, Job said. It sounds almost like he's speaking like Adam. But what he's trying to encourage us with is this. God always has a direct and active involvement in the bringing forth of life, whether it was in Adam or whether it's in Job quite a bit later. He is still forming life. He is not off at a distance from his creation. I hate that song. Remember the early 80s, that song that Bette Midler sang? God is watching us from a distance. Is that really how it is? Is there any kind of life that comes forth and is sustained from a distance from its creator? No, that is not the truth at all. Things are not spun into some sort of automatic motion. It's not that way. In fact, of the Lord Jesus, it is said that he upholdeth all things by the word of his power. And if there are laws by which life is governed in the world, those laws are upheld by the active involvement of Jesus. Men cannot take credit for the source or sustenance of life. They can't. If we talk about the womb, then we have to say things like this. If I did despise the cause of my manservant or my maidservant, when they contend with me, what then shall I do when God riseth up? And when he visiteth, what shall I answer him? Why? Did not he that made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us both in the womb? This will help you to be very careful about how you respond to anybody that's made in the image of God. See? Because all that he's made is accountable to him. But he's the one who brought forth from the womb. It doesn't happen by an automatic process. It just doesn't. And the sustenance, that which sustains life. It's easy for us to run down to Walmart and load up two weeks of groceries and put it in your cupboard and you're sustained and ready to go. You didn't have to raise the chicken. You didn't have to raise the cattle. You didn't have to raise the crops. And, and men take for granted what it takes to sustain life. It all comes from him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Don't forget who gives the rain so that those crops might be brought forth. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. Whether a man receives the notion that God is actively involved in life or not. The truth of the matter is the farmer's crops yield forth because God causes the increase. God is involved in all life. You remember when Noah came out of the ark, God said to Noah, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. You know when you're in the midst of Walmart looking at all that abundance? Think of this text. Because it's the truth. Everything you see that sustains life, he has given it. You see, there is the danger of affluence, and seeing that we have a lot of affluence around us, it's good for us to speak to this matter. There is the danger of affluence to not really connect <laughs> that abundance with God bringing forth that abundance so that we might live. There is this danger <laughs> to think that you're rich and increased in your own self and that you're self-sustained. This was the fall of the Laodiceans. I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. This truth that I'm telling you got away from them. Because you will not neglect the sources of life if you are acutely aware of your dependence upon God for life. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he is calling us to the dependence that we have upon him for that life. Amen. So important that we, that we see these things. In fact, this is why we pray this prayer. It's good for us to teach our young kids this, and it's good for us to let, not let this get away from us when we make our prayer to God, when it's time to sit down for meal. As the Lord said, give us this day our daily bread. 
Because if you have it, he gave it. Yeah. Amen. Walmart was just like a supply line. That's all it was. God's the one who gave it. There is an initiative, not only in our day. I was going to say that, and I thought, well, it's not anything new at all. Men have always sought to reject this notion who have been carnal of how dependent men are for God, for life. But there is an initiative to, to diminish the reality of man's dependence upon God for life, both in the world and in the professed church. Evolution is one of the forerunners of this very thing. Evolution teaches man that life comes from an impersonal, unintelligent source. The notion that life could come forth from a big bang is strange because what's non-life cannot give forth life. I mean, how is that even possible? Or that life can come forth from something that's not intelligent. It is obvious, and we've said this before, it is obviously the attempt of man to be unaccountable to God. Because if God's the one who gives life, then we are accountable to him. It's a dangerous thing. Very dangerous. And in the church, we find some of these very same things, the speak life movement. I'll tell you, as I am seeing more of what it means for Jesus to be the Christ, I am realizing more how anti-Christ that movement really is. The idea that God would at any time relegate to men creative power and that they can at will use it is a blasphemous notion. as if they can make something of nothing by just speaking. I repudiate that notion. Because I am convinced that when a man claims to do what only Christ can do, then he is in fact diminishing the value of Christ Jesus by what he's saying. And that is at the root of anti-Christ. It's wrong. Also, this self-help movement does the very same thing. For the self-help movement is an attempt to simulate life by routine and lifeless precept. Uh To teach the fear of God to men by a routine, which cannot be done. You cannot simulate spiritual life. But it's an attempt, brethren, to make a substitute for the bread of life. But now here's what Jesus says, not I am a source of life, I am the bread of life. By divine determination and by exclusive determination, God alone retains the prerogative to give and to sustain life. We must remember the objective of John's gospel In John chapter 20, verse 31, he says, These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. What does it mean for Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God? That he is the only one through whom life can spring forth and be sustained. Okay? All that Jesus is as the Christ, only Jesus is. Jesus is not a son of God. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. Jesus is not merely a man. He is divine. I am, that phrase is mentioned over and over by the Lord Jesus Christ. And John intentionally puts that phrase over and over throughout his gospel after opening the gospel by saying, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then he mentions these phrases of Jesus over and over. John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I am the door. 
By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And in John 15, he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. You remember Moses? He said this, and you probably knew I was going here. Well, God sent Moses to go down to Egypt and to free his people from the clutches of Pharaoh. Moses said, who do I tell them that sent me when they ask? I am that I am. Tell them I am hath sent thee. You see, God is the only self-existent one. In Genesis 21, 33, he is referred to as the everlasting God. Psalm 41, 13, blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Theologians have referred to it as eternity past and eternity future. These are both very vague areas to us, aren't they? But they are perfectly clear to him that is the I am in the past and the I am in the future. Hmm? That's our God. Before the mountains were brought forth, or even thou hadst formed the earth or the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Amen. There's our reference point. Hey, that's where things are clear to us as far as revelation is concerned. In the beginning, God made. But God existed before God made. He is the everlasting one. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. How could you receive everlasting life unless God himself was everlasting? How can a man that is finite give something that is everlasting? You see why this is so blasphemous for men to think that God relegates this to men on earth. I mean, this is a stupid idea. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. You know that part of what qualifies Jesus to be a priesthood is that he ever lives to make intercession for them. What's my point to you? It is simply this. It is the deity of Christ that qualifies him to be the bread of life and to give life and to sustain life. It's his deity that qualifies him to do those things. We always want to be mindful of his deity. I think, Brother Jason, you, you hit it right on the head that this is the thing that people are missing. They have brought Jesus down to such a low point. They don't even have his humanity right, let alone understanding his deity, who he is as divine. You know, I, I think people have low thoughts about eternal life because they have low thoughts about the source from which that life flows. I'll tell you, when you understand what Jesus promised with regards to eternal life, those things that I read about, I am, never die, never perish, never hunger, never thirst, dwelleth in me and I in him. Can you even fit that into the earth, to an earthly life experience? No, you can't. He's calling us up into a higher life. Amen. He is from heaven. He is the Lord of heaven. See, the first man was of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly. He's giving us an entirely different life. It's the life of God. Because he is, Jesus is, the everlasting one. He is. God said of him, thy throne, O God, is forever. Amen. He is God. You realize it? I mean, you know this. This was the contention the Jews had with Jesus. Mm -hmm. These were the claims. These are the reason why they killed him. I and the Father are one. Mm -hmm. Paul said, all things were created by him and for him. Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. Well, they knew exactly what he mean. And they, 
how can this man? They didn't understand this. He's divine. It's his divinity that qualifies him to give us life. We need someone who never sleeps or slumbers. We need someone in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge to sustain us. We need someone like that. All that's involved in the phrase, I am. That's not by coincidence, brother. And I know you know that, but I'll tell you, that's just edifying to think about the divine hood of Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus said to, said to one of his disciples, his name escapes me at this time, Philip, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because hmm? he is the express image of his being. He is the complete picture of God. You will never be a complete picture of God. We as a body will represent the glory of Christ, but Christ represents it all in himself. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily, and it's his divinity. I'm not saying that his humanity isn't involved in this, so don't, don't take me wrong. Don't think I'm pitting the two against another one. No, not at all. I'm just... I know I have to be careful not to react to the society all about us, but the people are missing this reality. That's why John makes so much of the divinity of Jesus. That's why he makes so much of it, because that's what qualifies him to give us life. I am the bread of life. Jesus has been given the power to give life. Jesus himself said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And he said, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that's his divinity, so that he might give eternal life. Right? These are great testimonies. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. John chapter 5, verse 21 to 23. As the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Whom he will. That is, by Jesus' own discretion, life is given. There are times where men were able, they were given this kind of a power. Okay, they were like unique times, like Paul. Unique times where like you could take aprons from Paul or handkerchiefs and things like this and people would be healed and there would be like life given and things like this. But it was only for a short time and he could never do this at will. But Jesus does this at will. He quickens whoever he wants to quicken. That's Jesus. That's another way of saying the power to give life has been entrusted to Jesus by God. He fully entrusted to him. In fact, Jesus went on to say that the Father judgeth no man. This entire discretion in giving life has been given over to the Son of God. That's a marvelous reality. And you remember why? It's so that all men would honor the Son even as they honor the Father. That is to say, when you come to Christ and believe on Christ, when you trust in Christ for life because you don't have it, that source in yourself, you honor the Son. You honor Him. The antithetical would be to coming up with some kind of a substitute, like a routine or a procedure or this kind of a thing. It dishonors Him. I'll tell you, when I know that, that like encourages me to come to Him. See, our dependence on Him, brethren, is not a dishonoring thing. The fact that we rely on Jesus is honoring to him, okay? In one sense, your dependence qualifies you to receive life from him, okay? It's a marvelous fit, you might say. Now, let's take this matter further. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. You know, hungering and thirsting are like the evidences that a man lacks what he needs for life, that he doesn't have it in himself. 
the resources needed to sustain life, he doesn't have it in himself, or he would hunger, or he would not hunger, and he would not thirst. It's actually a very merciful thing that God has given to us, kind of like an alarm bell. Huh? We need some resources. And you know, just about everybody in the world breaks from their daily routine and at least one to three times a day, stops, and because of hunger, takes in something that he doesn't have in himself. Why? Because he's reliant. He is dependent upon a source outside of himself to sustain his life. In fact, if he doesn't get that sustenance, he's going to die, and it doesn't take very long. It doesn't take very long. We're not talking years. If a man doesn't get the sustenance he needs for life, he's going to die. Remember what the Israelites said to Moses when they were in one of those complaining fits that they had. Would to God that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh plots and when we did eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Yeah, well, that's how, that's how dangerous hunger can be. I'm not for complaining, but that's the truth. A man's hungry and he doesn't get something for that hunger, he's going to die. That's the kind of hungering and thirsting that Jesus is talking about. Psalm 34.10, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Notice the association, lack, suffering, hunger. Doesn't have what he needs. He's got to get that from some other source. Whenever Samson, one of his great battles that he had, those extraordinary battles that he faced, he was sorely thirsty after that battle. Remember he said this? He called upon the Lord. He, he knew where to call. That's good. I'm glad for that. Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. You see, brethren, we are constantly dependent on a life source that we do not have of ourselves, I should say. It's not of us to sustain our own lives. It isn't. It just isn't. And so what does it mean for Jesus to say, if he that believes on me shall never hunger, and he that comes to me, or he that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. It is simply this, and Sister June already preached this, so I'm just going to underline what she said. There is no legitimate need in spiritual life that Jesus does not provide. I'll tell you, this seems like a very simple truth to say, but this can get away from you in a time of temptation. When you're in need and lacking, and you're tempted to panic, and you're tempted to turn aside from Jesus and to focus on that need because it's so pressing and so needy. That's why we have to preach this constantly. You see, Jesus is like the Garden of Eden. Remember, he told Adam and Eve, all of the trees of the garden you may eat, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything Adam and Eve needed to sustain their lives was in that garden. They did not have to leave the garden at all to get some kind of supply. Jesus is that garden. In the days where the prophecy of God concerning Egypt and the surrounding nations began to come to pass and the famine began to be very sore upon the land, the Egyptians came to Pharaoh because there were absolutely no provisions anywhere in the land whatsoever. And Pharaoh said, go to Joseph. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, that is what he's saying. Come to me. Why? Because there are no other resources. There aren't. Hmm? In fact, I think, I think sometimes I think there is a place to be candid and say what God said to Israel. Why do you spend your money for bread that does not satisfy? There are people that are giving themselves to routines and lifeless procedures that don't uphold life. They are a substitute for Jesus, and they are not coming to Jesus. And they're steeped in sin and enslaved to it and can't see what life's really all about. Why? Because all false teaching 
presents a substitute to what only Christ can give to men. Whether it's circumcision to the Galatians, or whether it's human philosophies to the Colossians, or whatever it is, it is all an attempt to rob Christ of his honor by encouraging men to maybe not all together, but in some aspect and avenue of life, maybe dealing with some particular thing to turn from Christ to something else because there is this sense that we need something that we don't think Jesus can supply. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. Yeah. He that believes on me shall never thirst. Mm -hmm. You will not lack any good thing. If you come to me, that is the point to be seen here. In fact, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily, and ye are complete in him. That's what Paul told the Colossians. That's the absolute truth. That means everything that God has to give to man, he has deposited in Christ. Amen. Amen. This kind of illuminates what it means when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has Amen. blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Christ. The good fight of faith is this, brethren. It's a fight to stay near Joseph. It's a fight to stay in the garden, so to speak. It's the fight to stay in the heavenly places where you were put when God saved you. Amen. It's the fight to stay with Christ. Mm -hmm. And all, all of Satan's arsenal, every bit of it, in whatever form it comes, is an attempt to turn you aside from Christ. Mm -hmm. Every bit of it. Uh, that simplifies what the good fight of faith is. Yeah. Yes, exactly. To never let anything mm -hmm. turn the eye of your trust from Christ. Sounds so simple. It is not so easy to work that out. No wonder it's the work of God that you believe on the one whom he has sent. Mm -hmm. Believing is not a basic thing. It is a fundamental thing, but it is a very profound thing as well. Considering that you have to believe in the face of all of this false teaching that is militating against that faith. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. Think of it this way. Never hungering and never thirsting is the assurance of an abundant and copious supply in Christ Jesus. Jesus has not changed. Like God, he could take him into his mouth and say, I am God, I change not. How you saw him dealing with men on earth, there are ways in which he still obviously deals that way. When the multitudes came to him in the sixth chapter, the scripture says that Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. As much as they wanted. Jesus doesn't dole out teaspoons of what you need for life. It's just not like that. It's not like that. Huh? He, doles, he gives a copious supply. It'll match your hunger. That's the truth. I'll tell you that, brethren, there's a lot of potential for receiving from Jesus in that regard. A person's only restrained by their desire. If your desire increases, guess what? You get more. That's how it works. Amen. But you will never come to Jesus and believe on Jesus and go away hungry. This multitude didn't, and you won't either. That's, that's a marvelous thing to see. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ. All your need, everything you need supplied by one man. Now think of some of the things that we have need that are directly related to the giving and sustaining of life. And I'm gonna, just going to end on, this, on these things. And these are all copious things. These are all like abundant things. Okay? How about forgiveness? You cannot sustain the life God gives at a distance from God. But if a person doesn't realize they've been forgiven from all things, they won't draw near, will they? I mean, this is something that a person has to be convinced of. One sin can move a person to withdraw from the living God. It doesn't take many. It just takes one. And the closer you draw to God, the more minute that sensitivity can be about sin. 
it's good to hear a word like this. By him, all that believe are justified from all things. Not some things, all things. All things. Amen. That's good. That's good news. I'll tell you, that, that is good news. The more, I, the more I grow, the more I hate sin. And I'll tell you what. It is first a hatred for the sin that I find in me. I hate my sin more than I hate anyone else's sin. It's a terrible sin. But to know that you can be justified from all things, brother, you've got to personalize that for yourself. Didn't we talk about this morning? It's the mercies of the Lord that we are not consumed. Brother Gene had that text. Huh? The point was those people hadn't perished, and that's what he was rejoicing in. Because if God had wanted to kill him, he could have done it already. It's of the mercies of the Lord that we are not consumed. You can be forgiven of all things. See, you'll not thrive in life until you know that all sins have been forgiven. All sins. And so we have good news to give to people. Not all people know this. They don't. We need to tell it to them. But that's in Christ Jesus. How about living a righteous life in an ungodly world? We can't do, we can't live a righteous life. You've heard people talk like that. Kind of a defeatist mentality. I think if we're not, we're not careful, we say a little bit too much about the flesh and not enough about the spirit. Amen. Oh, yes, I know. I know we have flesh to deal with. But we also have spirit. Mm -hmm. And what God has provided through that life, it doesn't mean that we ignore the flesh, but... That which comes from Jesus is much greater than that which we got from Adam, that's for sure. If by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. They will. If a man stumbles, it's not the product of coming to Jesus and believing on Jesus. I'm afraid sometimes our stumbling comes from not coming and not believing, which is a very active and intentional thing. Because Jesus has said, you'll never hunger, you'll never thirst. Hmm? He'll supply everything you need for life and godliness, that's the truth. If you lack wisdom, ask of him who gives liberally and does not abrade. Do you need to grow? Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you need comfort? Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Huh? That means God becomes a father unto you to comfort you preeminently because of your identity with Jesus, his son. That's preeminent. He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he comforts us in any trial, in any difficulty. Huh? Any difficulty. I've been facing some things myself here recently, but like I'm having to learn, I'm having to learn by experience not to get distracted in trouble and to trust in Christ in the midst of some kind of a difficulty. In that sense, brother, you can like thank God for trouble because you'll learn things in trouble that you can't learn any other way. Hmm? And you'll get comfort that you can't get any other way. That's the truth. If your trouble abounds, what does he say? Comfort abounds also. That's how it works. What is that? That's coming to Jesus and not hungering. That's believing on him and not thirsting. You do need comfort. You need it. He will supply it. How about resisting the devil? The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life. And have it more abundantly. That is, Jesus, I, I like to kind of blend this with something that John had said. He said the Son of God was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. So here's Satan. Here's Satan. He's going about stealing, killing, and destroying. And Jesus shows up and just disrupts the plan. He just disrupts it and starts giving life and starts opening the prison doors, and he binds the strong man, and pretty soon people just start walking out. What is that telling you? It's telling you that life is stronger than death. Amen. Oh, Satan won't let you think that when you're in the time of temptation. But then come back to these words. But I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And tell me, what do you know that Jesus has endeavored to do that he's not done? That's why he came. Jesus doesn't do anything in vain. And he's stronger than the devil. 
He that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. See, I'm just showing you what it means to not hunger and not thirst. People give in to temptation because they're hungry and thirsty. Oh, yes, there is a hunger and a thirst that will make you vulnerable in the time of temptation. But it only comes if you've neglected the Savior. You cannot, brethren, continue to abide in the fellowship of Jesus and be overcome by sin. You can't. A person will not do this because of the superiority of what Jesus offers to what the devil offers. But now we're back to the good fight of faith. That can get away from you. Hence the need to come and believe. I'm just telling you this. Everything you need for life and godliness is supplied through the knowledge of him. That's really what this comes down to. How does he dispense this supply? By coming and believing. That is to say, our need is met through our nearness and continual fellowship with the Son of God. Brethren, this is like a, this is like a major work to solidify your connection with Christ Jesus. That's like a major work to do that. When someone first comes into Christ, they're connected with Christ, but they're not rooted and grounded. You know, one of Paul's aspirations in ministry, and I'll, I'll close with this. I love this viewpoint of Paul in all of his ministry, whether he was ministering on Mars Hill or whether he was ministering among the assembly. This was like a preeminent concern for Paul. And he records this in Colossians 1, 27 to 29. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the hope of glory. Which means, and just here's the bottom line of this. That if you abide with Christ... You will be everything that God had intended you to be on the day that Jesus comes again. Amen. Mm, amen. Now, Paul knew this. This was the hope of glory because Paul took these words seriously. I'm the bread of life. There's no insufficient. Who spoke more about the sufficiency of Christ than the apostle Paul? But he said this. He said, whom we preach, that is that Christ, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man, every man, in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ. He wanted to present them perfect. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Paul never departed from the message of Christ unless, okay, unless it was this as the intent that something had come between the people and Christ and his attempt was, I shouldn't say attempt, but he endeavored as a master builder to remove whatever things were getting between the people and Christ in order to get back to the message of Christ Jesus. Amen. The more that you understand about the Christ, the more rooted you will be in Christ. Okay? Paul knew that that was the case. And we know that that's the case. And so that's why he endeavored to do just this very thing. To preach Christ so that the people would be solidified in their association with Christ. Because he knew if they were solidified in their association with Christ, they would never lack any good thing that they needed that pertains to life and godliness. And so that was his endeavor. And that's our endeavor in ministry. Don't assume that people know a lot about the Christ. And even if they do, like we have brethren here that, that they do, they know a lot about Christ. But they will be the first ones to tell you they need to know more about Christ. They need to know more. And they need to be more solidified. And they need to, in their life, to be able to have less, less bypass, less, if I can say, distractions, things like this that might turn us aside from this essential thing in life. 
What is the essence of eternal life? To know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Everything else is incidental. This is what it's all about. And so I, I, that's my endeavor. You know, I, I'm, I'm certainly leagues behind the Apostle Paul, but I do have this desire, okay? We want to solidify in people's minds and hearts this understanding of Christ, solidify their own personal association with Christ, because if that ever gets solidified and they learn to not let things get between them and Christ, the supply will always be there. They'll always have exactly what they need, and they will make it home safely. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his son. So, so I commit this word to you. This is, these, are the, these are the ways I've seen, it, seen this marvelous truth of what it means to not hunger and not thirst. But Jesus will never disappoint. Never will. So thank God. Thank God for Jesus.